when she came to 1969, she kept talking about 1926 and talking about Gershwin and others who were current then. She said, I know it's 1969, I feel it's 26. I know I'm 64, I feel I'm 21. She said, I've been a spectator for the last 43 years. Hello and welcome to On Books. That up front was Oliver Sacks, the British neurologist and author. And he was speaking about one of his patients, one of his patients who lost 40 years of memory of her life and the life that this woman lives. Uh, Oliver Sacks has met and, and worked with so many patients who have uh, brain disorders. And he's brought his stories in, in a way that is just artful and insightful about the human condition and about how our minds work and how our lives work. And that's what I'm going to bring you here. Uh, one of his most famous collections of stories, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Uh, this is 24 stories, uh, true stories, of patients that he worked with. Um, you, you may or may not have heard of the book, but likely you've heard of the movie Awakenings. Uh, Awakenings is a 1990s film where Robin Williams plays Oliver Sacks. So in this episode, I'm going to build context around the book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, by first looking at one of Oliver Sacks' earliest books, Awakenings, then diving into the story, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and third, looking at Musicophilia, which is one of Oliver's latest books. Through each of these chapters, I will show you some of the connections and overlap that I think will paint a really nice picture. Later in the episode, I will have a discussion about the book with Nathaniel Daw. He is a professor of neuroscience at Princeton University. And finally, I will do a brief reading in remembrance of Oliver Sacks. So please keep listening and more to come. Part one, Awakenings. Awakenings is one of Dr. Sachs' earliest books. It's the second book he came out with in 1973. And it's the true story of, of his work in Beth Abraham Hospital, which I would offhand say is like a mental institution or clinic, essentially. And what happened was in the early 1920s, there was an epidemic of something known as encephalitis lethargica. It was what, what Sachs refers to as a sleepy sickness disease. It essentially left the patients catatonic like statues and some were stuck in a loop here's dr Sachs explaining for some it was a kind of dream world but others were condemned to tormenting repetitions like the endless contemplation of two equals two equals two one patient described how she had to walk around a mental square to seven notes from a verity theme and this would go on for hours and days, wouldn't That's stop. Hell. Mm. This, I think, is what one intuits, that uh, there may indeed be something like a sort of hell. The patients were trapped in this sort of hell for 30 to 40 years until Dr. Sachs came along, and he began to study and work with them. And he began to see small awakenings in things that they would respond to. This is a clip from the movie where Robin Williams is playing Oliver Sacks, and he discusses some of those awakenings. Some things could reach him, though. The mention of his name, notes of a particular piece of music, or the touch of another human being. Yet, the rest of the time, the patients were in this just physical state of, of what seemed like sleep, just statues. So he began to experiment with some drugs. There was a drug called L-DOPA at the time, which was showing benefits for Parkinson's patients. Now these patients didn't have Parkinson's, but he had done some research and began to experiment. And what he found, and why the book is called Awakenings, is that the benefits of this drug essentially woke these people up. Here is Robert De Niro in the movie, one of the first patients. He plays Leonard, who is now speaking after 35 something years of being in the state. My name is Leonard Law. It has been explained to me that I have been away for quite some time. I'm back. Damn, that's beautiful. 
it's it's such a great movie. There's so many great scenes um, about Oliver Sacks' life and about this condition of humanity. And this story comes up. I'd, I'd encourage you to see the film. And, you know, back to The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. This story comes up and is mentioned uh, a handful of times in the book, especially in Chapter 10, which follows one of the patients. And I don't want to give away too much, but if you do see Awakenings, um, you'll, you'll see the scene where there are some side effects of the Eldoba, and this is discussed here in the book. So I'm going to read now from The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. In 1969, I gave the sleepy sickness or post-encephalitis patients Eldoba, a precursor of the transmitter dopamine, which was greatly lowered in their brains. They were transformed by it. First, they were awakened from their stupor to health. Then they were driven toward the other pole of ticks and frenzy. So while Dopa awoken them and, and gave them their life again, its effects didn't last as long as we would have hoped. And it resulted in these ticks and Tourette's and, and all these kind of symptoms. And this is chronicled in Awakenings, the book and the movie, as well as in this chapter in The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. It's definitely worth a read. Part two, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. So I want to switch our attention now to the main story of the book. It's the first story in, uh, in the book, and it only spans about 12 pages. It's about, it's the story of a man known as Dr. P, who we'll come to find out has an impairment known as visual agnosia. And what this means is that he has the inability to recognize certain objects. You may have heard of protopagnosia, or more commonly known as face blindness. You may have heard of this idea of face blindness, where certain people cannot recognize faces. And that is, that's one type of this visual agnosia. So this is the story of Dr. P. I'm going to read from the beginning here and highlight, not the whole thing, but I'm going to read some of the highlights here. So Dr. P. Dr. P was a musician of distinction, well known for many years as a singer and then at the local school of music as a teacher. It was here in relation to his students that certain strange problems were first observed. Sometimes a student would present himself and Dr. P would not recognize him or specifically would not recognize his face. So Dr. P comes to Oliver Sacks. And at first, Sacks doesn't really see what could be the problem. You know, he said, he's a lovely man. And I thought, you know, how could there be anything wrong with this person? He could communicate well. And, you know, he was just, he had it together. And, you know, Sacks goes and he does a few different tests on him. One involving taking off the patient's shoes, Dr. P's shoes. And after the test, he says, Dr. Sacks says, can I help? And Dr. P says, help with what? And Sack says, can I help you put on your shoe? And Dr. P looks around the room and he looks down at his foot and he finally says, that is my shoe. Dr. Sack says, did I miss here? Did he miss see? My eyes, he explained, and he put a hand to his foot. This is my shoe, no? No, it's not. This is your foot. There is your shoe. Ah, I thought that was my foot. Was he joking? Was he mad? Was he blind? Is this one of his strange mistakes? It was the strangest mistake I had ever come across. So in this situation, he mistakes his foot for a shoe. And the next page, he mistakes his wife for a hat, as the title says. So he also appeared to have decided that the examination was over and started to look around for his hat. He reached out his hand and took a hold of his wife's head tried to lift it off and put it on he had apparently mistaken his wife for a hat how did this man this man dr p how did he even get around how was he going to work what dr what dr Sachs finds out is that dr p well first off he doesn't know that anything is wrong and Sachs asks in his writing he asks what was more tragic the man who doesn't know that something is wrong and has something wrong or the man who just thinks everything's fine and has something wrong. You know, according to Dr. P, pretty much everything was okay. He wasn't really freaking out about, about all these, uh, these mistakes that he was making. Dr. Sachs in his writing asks, how does he do anything? 
I wondered to myself, what happens when he's dressing, going to the laboratory, has a bath? You know, how does he do these things? I followed his wife into the kitchen and asked her, for instance, how does he manage to dress himself? It's just like the eating, she explained. I put his usual clothes out in all the usual places, and he dresses without difficulty, singing to himself. He does everything singing to himself, but if he's interrupted and loses the thread, he comes to a complete stop, but doesn't know his clothes, but doesn't know his own body. He sings all the time, eating songs, dressing songs, bathing songs, everything. He can't do anything unless he makes a, a song. And I can relate to this. I play piano, and if I start on the first note, I can play it all the way through, like a certain piece. If you ask me to start on the third bar, even though I could read the music, sometimes just starting on the, you know, somewhere in between is so tough, you know, especially without the music either. I'll be like, I almost can't even remember. I mean, I know what it sounds like in my head, but it just, and it'll take me an extra second or two to get there. But there's a second of like not knowing. And I can imagine that's what it's like for Dr. P, who, if you start with the music, you can just flow and flow and get through your daily chores and, and your life. But once you break that thread, it's like a different part of your brain that has to do piecing it together. So it's through this work with Dr. P that Dr. Sachs diagnoses him with visual agnosia, meaning that he construed the world as a computer construes it. Um, it's like a schema of relationships of one thing to the other, but all in abstraction, essentially, you know, at like a higher level. Uh, it was kind of like a hallucin hallucination, right? Um, where he admitted visual characteristics, visual narrative and scenes, but he remembered the, the words of the characters, the people around him, but he couldn't remember their faces. So there were some things that were getting in and some things that he couldn't. And this is the case with music. Music was something that he could hook onto, that he could relate, and he could make a song to get through the day. Sachs writes, I can't tell you what I find wrong, but I'll say what I find right. You're a wonderful musician, and music is your life. What I would prescribe in a case such as yours is a life which consists entirely of music. Music has been the center now make it a whole of your whole life. Part 3, Musicophilia. Musicophilia is the title of one of Oliver Sacks' books that came later in his life. This book was published in 2007, about 20 so years after The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And what I'm doing here by presenting these three books, Awakenings, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and Musicophilia, is trying to show just, just glimpses into the work of Oliver Sacks with his patients, as well as some of the connections between the works to give a little bit of greater context. Where you and I left off with Dr. P and the man who mistook his way for a hat, we were talking about how music was able to guide him. Uh, there were some later, later thoughts from Oliver Sacks when he spoke with Dr. P's wife, and he found out that though he could not recognize his students if they sat still, you know, if they were merely images and faces, he, he couldn't see them. He would suddenly recognize them, though, when they made movements. And this, in a way, is, is what, what he called their body music. And it's that body music and that rhythm that Dr. P was able to detect them with. So there's this link here between music, and there's a few other stories now in Musicophilia. And one that I really want to highlight that I absolutely love is the story of Clive Weering. So Clive Weering is a man with severe amnesia and complete memory loss, right? If you've ever seen Memento, uh, basically this man has no past and no future. Like he is just like, <laughs> like the way a Zen monk would want to be in the moment. This dude is literally in the moment. It's all he has. He cannot make a memory. Let me give you an example of this. I have some audio here. This is from an episode of Radio Lab where they're interviewing Dr. Sachs and Clive and Clive's wife. So check this out. 
He is extremely intent on trying to、um, document his state. He is very, very precise. He would look at his watch to see what time was this momentous event occurring, a first consciousness, and so he would write down ten o six awake first time, and then have the same sensation and put ten o seven awake first time, truly awake first time. Ignore the last entry. Now I'm awake. This is the first real awakeness, and so the the diaries are line by line a succession of astonished awakenings. People's entries in the diary are rubbish. What does that mean? No idea. Did you write that? I've no conscious of consciousness at all. No, we're showing it now for the first time. But it's is it your handwriting? Yes, it is. But I know nothing about it at all. So how do you think it got there? I don't. I presume the doctor don't know. But you must. No,、have. I haven't. I haven't seen the book at all till now. No, I'm all I'm saying. No, that means that means I haven't seen it. I have no knowledge of it at all. That's all. There's no knowledge of that book at all. It's entirely new to me. But you put who would put that? I don't know. No, 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 no. Oh, for heaven's sake, use intelligence, for heaven's sake. I haven't read this yet. Read the bloody thing. So you, you heard it yourself. I mean, Clive, he can't make new memories, and he's just trapped in this this moment, like Groundhog's Day, but every single second, and. Saxon, his work, he wonders. You know, what does a man consist of without his memory? Does he have feelings? Does he know ethics of right and wrong? What parts of a man are left when he or she is without the, the memories? Without it, you're just stuck, stuck in a constant state of of this meaningless, this meaningless moment that just goes on and on. And on again, there is one memory which Clive does have, and that is his reaction to when his wife walks in the room. Because when his wife walks in the room, he gets excited; he recognizes her. Oliver Sacks believes that our brains, that in the wiring deep below, somewhere in there, is a place where love can be stored, and where amnesia. Cannot get it like a safe vault, ten layers down in our heads, and it's this kind of emotional memory that that we can feel, and it's in that same place that music can also be stored, where that rhythm is also found. I'm gonna continue with the episode here a little bit、um, and let Clive's wife tell you about it. I taken him off the ward. To get some peace, because he was hypersensitive to noise, and、uh, the most peaceful place happened to be the chapel, and we picked up a, an old hymn book, and for want of anything better to do, and because Clive talked jumble most of the time at that stage, I began to sing, and all of a sudden, like it was the most natural thing in the world, he joined in. <laughs> He could sing. I was amazed that he could still read music and sing. Was it a tentative sort of stumbling no, no, thing, or no, no, just like falling off a log? Full voice, strong, everything. Yep. All right. So at this part, I want to introduce you to Nathaniel Daw. As I mentioned, he's a neuroscientist, professor of neuroscience at Princeton University, and him and I were chatting via email, and he was very excited to talk to me about this book. He stopped by our studio here in New York City. So without further ado, here's my conversation about the man who mistook his wife for a hat and Oliver Sacks with Nathaniel Daw. Let's talk about let's talk about one of the stories. So chapter、sure. two is it's the lost mariner. That's right. Right. So what? Um. Uh. Yeah. Set it up. What? What's? What's this? What's this guy's story? So this guy is. Uh, uh, I think he was、uh, in the navy in World War Two.、Mm-hmm. Um. His name's uh Jimmy, right? Jimmy, Jimmy G. I think that's right. Um. And he shows up, you know, in Doctor、uh, Sachs's、uh, ward. I think he worked in a series of nursing homes and hospitals in New York.、Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, Very disoriented and and profoundly amnestic, 
and he he seems to think it's still 1945, basically when it's actually, um, it's actually like the 70s or something. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it seems as though uh, he he become an alcoholic in the 60s, and there's a, a sort of rare disease that can happen due to nutritional, I think, um, a problem that that very severe alcoholics can get that causes brain damage and causes this kind of amnesia. Yeah, and he got it, you know, in the 60s. Um, but he lost all his memory back to the 40s. Yeah. Um, and then going forward, the ability to form new memories. And so he's um, sort of profoundly disoriented all the time and confused about. He, he can't make new memories. Exactly. And that's, that's essentially. Um, what Have you ever met anyone or have your students worked with anyone who couldn't? I mean, because I only know it from movies like Memento or like Looney Tune cartoons or something. Like, I don't. I, what he, is that like? I mean, I think it's horrible. I, I also haven't I haven't met one of these patients. There are not that many of them. I um, mean, it's not incredibly rare. But that's a good question. Like, how how many? Because you see this in like Friends episodes, and like you know, people have amnesia. Like, how how rare is amnesia? Well, I, I think it's something different. Like, the, you know, if you get bonked on the head and you have a little, you know, a little amnesia. Or, Can that happen? I, I think so. Yeah. Or you hit with a pan on the head and you get, like, <laughs> yeah, all like, of a sudden like, like, yeah, <laughs> forget like things. cartoon. Yeah, Tom and Jerry. Kind I just of wondered thing. that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, that can happen. But the, but the kind of uh, this kind of thing. You know, there's a famous patient called H M. Who's uh, mm. uh, uh, th- this happened around the 50s. He was given uh, brain surgery for epilepsy, and so they, uh, a lot of this book is about epilepsy and the temporal lobes, which are important in memory. Well, and what is epile- epilepsy, like specifically? Uh, uh, sorry, epilepsy is uh, is a disorder in the brain that's sort of caused uh, has sort of uncontrolled activity in parts of the brain, seizures, uh, electrical activity that's that's sort of flowing around in an uncontrolled way. And it, oh, oh yeah, when you get seizures and stuff like that's, that. Right? That's epilepsy. Okay, so people it. who have that profoundly and intractably. Eventually, they cut out the part of the brain that's causing it. Um, and in this particular poor patient's case, they cut out the same structure on both sides of the brain that's involved in the formation of memories. And he was turned into one of these patients. Well, if you have epilepsy, like I had a friend and she had, I mean, this is like sad a little bit, but she had like grand mal seizure. Like, does mm-hmm. that mean you have to get your mm-hmm. brain cut out? Okay, okay. <laughs> that's the end of, you know, okay, that's this the, is last, like the last thing you, know, you do. I mean, it's not incredibly unusual, but they also don't, now they know better than to cut out both sides at the same time and so on, right? They, 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 they take out the smallest piece that they can. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but uh, but it, so people, most people are treated with drugs and so on. But if that doesn't work, you know, for, for a long time and the seizures are really debilitating, they can go wow. to surgery, right? Good to know. Um, so anyway, there was a very famous patient who, uh, who had the surgery and, and became amnestic and very much like the patient in this book. Like, and, and he was studied for many many years uh, and we learned a lot about the brain's memory system from this one patient and they're you know they're more like him but they're not uh, that many yeah so i've never met him or any of them yeah this guy hm that you're talking him. about yeah exactly yeah um and so the lost mariner is one of these um and so you know at one level it's, it's sort of amazing that this guy is so confused about how old his brother is and you know thinks he's so surprised by the fact that people have been on the moon and he's sort of constantly oh, yeah. living in the past. Yeah, there's this moment um, when he, um, I think this is the story when, when Dr. Sachs takes a mirror and he puts it in front of his face and he, uh, he's just he like, panics. he panics because he, he, he believes that he's like in his 20s or, or he's stuck at 20. Um, oh my God, yeah. He's, it's just like, uh, it has, I think it's right here. I thrust the mirror toward him. Look in the mirror and tell me what you see. Is this a 19-year-old looking out from the mirror? He suddenly turned ashen and gripped the sides of the chair. Jesus Christ, he whispered. Christ, what's going on? And he just like has this nightmare, this panic of 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 this like disconnect, I guess. Yeah, with, like, I, mean, reality. I, mean, I think one of the things that this chapter really dramatizes is, you know, it's not just these little events where surprising things happen to him all the time. It's that his whole life is this sort of disconnected series of even kind of he can't keep track of what he's doing from one moment to the next, and so yeah. his whole experience is reduced to just isolated, disembodied kind of moments. Yeah, um, and that just seems so terrifying and, and, and bizarre. Um, and there's a, a, a sort of companion chapter with a, another patient with the same disorder. I think it's number twelve who kind of reacts much more. Is, is sort of much more panicky about this kind of all the time. Ah, uh, yeah, it's kind t- of twelve. Contrast. It's the uh, a, matter a matter of identity. Of identity. Is that the one? And he sort of constructs this confabulated series of identities that's constantly changing, and it's a reflection of this, the fact that he can't kind of hold a thought from one moment to the next. 
when you're when you're reading these these stories, what how does this apply to your life? How do you how do you think about it? I mean, so I actually once had an experience uh, when I was having a sort of minor surgery, and I had some kind of what they told me was going to be light sedation that was that mm-hmm. can cause sort of a, a brief kind of memory blackout. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember, you know, countdown from ten, you know, and then. I'm in a chair and they're offering me Sprite or ginger ale or something. And it was just horrifying. Like it was, I was like a complete panic. There had been this like, uh, it just felt so scary that all of a sudden I was here. It was not like waking up, you know, waking up isn't scary. It was just like whatever came before was gone. Um, Like you, you, uh, you couldn't remember the past. Yeah, but it was very sudden. It was like, you know, the lights came on. I mean, I, I couldn't remember what happened immediately before, but here I am sitting up and talking. Yeah. Uh, and I found that terrifying. Um, and, I, and so I, I thought of that moment when I read this chapter um, and how this must be what every moment is like. For this. And this, I think Memento also has that kind of, yeah. exactly that feel to it, right? Which presumably was inspired by this. So. Yeah, it reminds me of waking up on, on Saturday morning and you're like, <laughs> Uh, you know, I slept at a friend's house, and you wake up and like, where the hell am I? Yeah, exactly. What's going on? Yeah, and then you know, like too much to drink. And- yeah, and like you're on, I was on some couch, and then there's this moment <laughs> where like you're, I feel like my brain reboots, and then all of a sudden you're like downloading, you're like turning on my Mac, but it's my brain. Yeah, and then you're like, yeah. oh, I mean, that's what to not have a past. I don't know. Yeah, and but but if if it were like that all the time. I mean, so one of the things we've learned from these patients, I mean, I guess the other part of what this means to me is just professionally, you know, I'm very interested in how, you know, how these processes work in the brain and how these different dissociable processes work together to, to make, you know, our brains do what they can do. Um, yeah. And what's been really interesting with these patients is what they can learn and what they can't, right? So memory isn't a single thing. Um, so these patients have lost what's known as episodic memory or autobiographical memory. So the sort of experience the sort of rich memories of your own personal experiences um though that's what's gone and also the kind of uh, the ongoing sort of consciousness or trace of you know connecting those from one moment to the next but they can you know they can still learn to ride a bicycle or something right sort of procedural kind of memory or uh, other things um and, and so that's been very informative scientifically for understanding the the different processes in the brain that work together to to produce you know what we think of as memory. Yeah, are there are there layers of where things? I might not use the right words here, but help me out. Um, where like where things are stored in the brain, like with memory. I think that most people think of memory as like this filing cabinet in your brain where you where you put things in, and then like when you want it, you grab it out. Um, how? How does memory work? Is that too big of a question? <laughs> that is a big question. Here? Um, I, I mean, I think the thing I would say, like, the, where does it go? Like, how yeah. can it not be there? Is, so that, is the kind of the question? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good question. Um, I think it's a, a set of processes in the brain that uh-huh. are, you know, working together to record things and, uh, kind of write them out and, and what's called consolidate them, um, and then retrieve them. Uh, and then there are different systems for different sorts of memories. Uh, it's thought that the main sort of building block of all of this is the strength of synapses, right? So neurons connect to other neurons uh, by sort of wiring, um, and the strength that by which one connects to the other is, uh, can change, and it's thought that's sort of the basis for uh, for memory. But And that in particular, these kind of epi- rich kind of episodic memories uh, relate to the connection of a bunch of different kind of independent events or aspects mm-hmm. of different sensory impressions in the different senses and uh, all the different things that come together when you had breakfast, what you ate and where you were and what you were thinking and what you're smelling. And so that's sort of what characterizes these episodic memories. Um, and it's like a sort of web of, of neurons coding those different things. Like physical, sort of physical together. things, like memories yeah. are physical things. Yeah, they're changes in the strength of, of these connections between, between neurons. Um, so when you lose a memory, do you lose a physical thing? Like, do you lose a connect, like a physical connection? Or we don't know. I, don't I mean, know. potentially. But one of the things that's happening in these patients is is literally like you know neurons in their brains are dying, right? Like you know, that, I think Korsakoff syndrome is caused by the degeneration of some of these structures. Like neurons are dying, and the, their oh yeah connections are dying. Um, 
that's not you know the only thing. Alzheimer's disease is closely related to this, right? And that's also a yeah. degenerative disorder. Um, in general, I think pretty much the people in this book are people with kind of holes in their head one way or another. Like stuff is missing, and that's you know. yeah. But but the brain is sort of spread out. It's not like it, it, it's hard to uh, memories don't live in like one one place. They, they're sort of distributed. Did you know that? Um, did you know that Oliver Sacks is face blind himself? I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, that, that's interesting. My wife uh, claims to be face blind as well. There's there's a kind of face blindness that's uh, congenital that you inherit or that you're born with, um, and certainly people are better or worse at it. There's a, there's a big discussion in, in neuroscience, a big fight for many years about whether faces are special, like whether there's particular circuitry in the brain that's really just for faces, um, as opposed to recognizing other complex things like you know, cars or something. Or oh, else. interesting. Um, and, and it's clear that the, the patient in this chapter has you know, can't recognize anything, right, except for yeah. I think, you know, pyramids and sort of simple solids. Um, so it's not just faces, but... Um, I think there are people who are much have a much more selective, supposedly much more selective deficit to faces. And, so you, you um, mentioned you and your wife. You said she has, <laughs> is, is it true or is, is she just bad with names? I mean, we've never or? tested her. Uh, when she, you come home, really does she knows, know who you are? She, yeah, she knows me. Okay. Yeah, it's not, uh, <laughs> She's not like, uh, who is this man in my house? Yeah, exactly. Get out of my house. <laughs> okay. Gets me as a hat, yeah. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to wear it on my head. <laughs> no, no, it's not that bad. Okay. I mean, but I mean, there's, these things all are on a spectrum. Everything's on a spectrum. The the memory chapters is, again, an example where, you know, after mm-hmm. a while, sometimes they can remember where they are you know the hm famously i think also kind of tragic his i think his father he was very close to his father and his father died and so he had to like mourn for that you know every day for months and months and months and months and then finally like was able to internalize the fact that his father was dead so it's like many of these deficits are not okay but that and that's and that's something everyone can relate to i mean how you know if you've ever lost someone or you know, even just uh, ex-girlfriend or, or breakup, it's like these, I don't know where they are in my head, but they're in there. And you just hear this voice, you know, of this regret or these person and you walk around with this, like, I don't know. It just, it just starts. It's like, where's, where's the line between what actually happened and, and where your mind is just like, and where's the line between and like, insanity like you know you feel a little <laughs> bit you're like am i thinking a little bit too much <laughs> you yeah, know yeah, yeah there's a lot of interesting things there uh, obsession and, obsession and also the, the way that memories are constructed right and altered over time and, yeah you know they're not i think one of the things that that this book uh, there's all these sections on on epile- on these epilepsy that bring back memories uh-huh. of childhood and so on and it makes it sound like there's this perfect video recording hitting in your head that is is, is suddenly revealed of, of you know, which is an accurate recording of what happened to you when you were a little kid, and mm-hmm. and that just can't possibly be true, right? We you know we know that memory is fragmentary and constructed, and a lot of gaps are filled in, um, and that when you access it, it changes, and so when you're you know ruminating on the you know your ex girlfriend, <laughs> you're you're constructing a story and you're changing your memories and you you know it's 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 every time you access them they become labile again. Um, that's a, that's something that's of interesting a lot of study of right now. Um, I don't know what labile means, but uh, uh, <laughs> are you and um, what do you mean by like changes every time you, I think of my ex girlfriend? Is that I mean, she like I she looks different to me, or I can like change the reality of what I believe, or, or so. Well, so a few things. So certain, certainly, like all of your memories, all of your experiences are partly inferences, right? Like your your sensations, your you know, your eyes and your ears are are imperfect, um, and a lot of what your brain does is interpret them, right? So even not just in memory, but in the kind of day to day living you're building a story for yourself, right? That's Got also, it. I think, kind of a, a theme in this, uh, here, here and there in this, in this book. Uh, and that's all the more so when you're retrieving a memory, right? Like, memories are really spotty. You, you blanket fill them. fill stuff in. Yeah, you um, fill it in. And then you remember what you filled in as though it were real. And, um, and it, there's also the, the thing I mentioned about lability um, is that... Uh, 
there's evidence that when you retrieve a memory, if I if I make you, and this is sort of in rats, so it's it's a much more kind of stylized kind of memory. But you you know you have uh, you, a rat form a memory of of some fearful event or something, and then you retrieve it. You can give them a drug, which is known to halt the formation of new memories. It also erases the memory that you just retrieved. It's like the, the eternal sunshine. Eternal sunshine. Mind, yeah, that's what of, I was thinking. Um, you know, it really is like that, uh, and they're. There's hope to use it in people to treat PTSD and stuff, but but it's but the the act of retrieving the memory seems to require it to be kind of written back out again, or it's lost basically, or it's changed. You know, it it, it, it renders it. Label means, you know, a changeable, um, and so it's vulnerable to interference or to erasure when it's retrieved. Um, so memory is changeable by by remembering. So the more yeah. I think about something that I don't want to think about, <laughs> I mean, I think probably you're. You know, strengthening it in, in that case, but but, oh, I but am. you might be changing it too. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I feel like the more I I stop trying to think of certain people uh, that I don't, you know, that the more <laughs> that it does strengthen it. Um, Not sure I can help you there. Yeah, but, but the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And, yeah, because he in Eternal Sunshine, he I think he goes to a company and they erase his parts of his memory. Right, that's what it is. That's a great movie. That's a if great were, movie. If this were a movies podcast, we could talk. We about could that. talk for hours that's about that movie. movie. Yeah, that's a great movie. Charlie Kaufman. Charlie. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> we're on the same page here. All right, good. Love runs high in this time. Give it to me easy and let me try with pleasured hands to take you in the sun. I want to finish this episode with a quick remembrance of Oliver Sacks. Um, he was really inspirational uh, to me and to so many people out there um, with particularly for me, just how much he cared about his work. I've always found that if you're passionate about the work that you do, that you can inspire other people. Um, it, you know, he studied the brain and brought it to us in a way that that we could all relate to it and, and that showed us the human side of that. And anytime you see a Ted talk, that's kind of obvious um, by anyone who's really passionate about their fields, whether it's something about like the, the genius of ants, you know, something I never would have thought about. Um, if it's told in a compelling way, it can, it can really inspire you. And I think it takes, you need to really step out of your field and empathize with the audience that you're writing for and that you're talking to. And, um, that's what I get from Oliver Sacks' work and just from the clarity and uh, good heartedness, the place that he came from was just so good hearted. And, and you can see that state of being becomes the doing in all the work that he has produced from there. And I think it's really beautiful. Um, so I would direct you, uh, after this, if you want to listen to, there's, over a dozen Radiolab episodes where he's a guest in some form, as well as a final episode called Remembering Oliver Sacks, put together by Jad and Rob, the uh, hosts of Radiolab. So I'll put those uh, links on the site underneath the show notes. And they're all really great. I've listened to them all, love them all. And there's one that really struck me, which I think you'll find interesting, is an interview between Chuck Close and Oliver Sacks. Now, Chuck Close, he's the photorealist painter. I'm sure if you've ever been to the Museum of Modern Art, you, it's the photo of the big person's face. And when you go really close, it's just dots and specks. But when you move back, you can see a whole face. Uh, that's the work of Chuck Close. So it's Chuck Close and Oliver Sacks having a 30-minute conversation about face blindness. And what I learned, and was surprised to learn, is that they both have this. Oliver Sacks himself as well is face blind. Here's a brief clip from that Radio Lab episode where Oliver Sacks is telling us about how he is indifferent toward looking at people's faces when he goes on vacation and uh, in his apartment at home. When, uh, when for example, I first visited Australia, I came back with, with hundreds of photos and people looked through them and said, yes, but didn't you meet any human beings? <laughs> um, <laughs> because all my photos were of scenery and plants where I'm very at home. And I, I noticed that when you get in the elevator in your apartment, you don't have any idea who the neighbors are, but you do look down, right? Oh, I know they're dogs. Yeah. 
So if they were to switch dogs, you'd just be. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I... All right. So, like I said, there's so much more for you to learn and explore with the brain and neurology and Oliver Sacks. There's so much out there. Uh, in closing, I'm going to read This is My Own Life. Oliver Sacks wrote this on February 19th, 2015, just a few months before he passed. A month ago, I felt that I was in good health, even robust health. At 81, I was still swimming a mile a day, but my luck has run out. A few weeks ago, I learned that I have multiple metastases in the liver. Nine years ago, it was discovered that I had a rare tumor of the eye, an ocular melanoma. The radiation and lasering to remove the tumor ultimately left me blind in that eye. But though ocular melanomas metastasize in perhaps 50% of cases, given that particular of my own case, the likelihood was much smaller. I am among the unlucky ones. I feel grateful that I have been granted nine years of good health and productivity since the original diagnosis, but now I am face to face with dying. The cancer occupies a third of my liver, and though its advances may be slowed, this particular sort of cancer cannot be halted. It is up to me now to choose how to live out the months that remain to me. I have to live in the richest, deepest, most productive way I can. In this, I am encouraged by the words of one of my favorite philosophers, David Hume, who upon learning that he was mortally ill at age 65, wrote a short autobiography in a single day in April of 1776, and he titled it, My Own Life. Quoting from Hume, he writes, I now reckon upon a speedy dissolution, Hume wrote. I have suffered very little pain from my disorder, and what is more strange, have, notwithstanding, the great discipline of my person, never suffered a moment's abatement of my spirits. I possess the same ardor as ever in study and the same gaiety in company. Sachs continues in his own voice, saying, I have been lucky enough to live past 80, and the 15 years allotted to me beyond Hume's three score and five have been equally rich in work and love. In that time, I have published five books and completed an autobiography, rather longer than Hume's few pages, to be published this spring. I have several other books nearly finished. Hume continued, I am a man of mild dispositions, of command and temper, of an open, social, and cheerful humor, capable of attachment, but little susceptible of enmity, and of great moderation in all my passions. Here I depart from Hume, why I have enjoyed loving relationships and friendships and have no real enmities. I cannot say, nor would anyone who knows me say, that I am a man of mild dispositions. On the contrary, I am a man of vehement disposition, with violent enthusiasms and extreme immoderation in all my passions, Sax writes. And yet one line from Hume's essay strikes me as especially true. It is difficult, he wrote, to be more detached from life than I am at present. Over the last few days, I have been able to see my life as from a great altitude, as a sort of landscape, and with a deepening sense of the connection of all its parts. This does not mean I am finished with life. On the contrary, I feel intensely alive, and I want and hope in the time that remains to deepen my friendship, to say farewell to those I love, to write more, to travel as if I have strength, to achieve new levels of understanding and insight. This will involve audacity, clarity, and plain speaking, trying to straighten my accounts with the world. But there will be time, too, for some fun, and even some silliness as well. I feel a sudden clear focus and perspective. There is no time for anything inessential. I must focus on myself, my work, and my friends. I shall no longer look at news hour every night. I shall no longer pay any attention to the politics or arguments about global warming. This is not indifference, but detachment. I still care deeply about the Middle East, about global warming, about growing inequalities, but these are no longer my business. They belong to the future. I rejoice when I meet gifted young people, even the ones who biopsied and diagnosed my metastases. 
I feel the future is in good hands. I have been increasingly conscious for the last 10 years or so of deaths among my contemporaries. My generation is on the way out in each death, and with each death, I have felt as an abruption, a tearing away part of myself. There will be no one like us when we are gone, but there will be no one like anyone else ever. When people die, they cannot be replaced. They leave holes that cannot be filled. For it is fate, the genetic and neutral fate of every human being to be a unique individual, to find his own path, to live his own life, to die his own death. I cannot pretend I am without fear, but my predominant feeling is one of gratitude. I have loved and been loved. I have been given so much and I have given something in return. I have read and traveled and thought and written. I have had an intercourse with the world, the special intercourse of writers and readers. Above all, I have been a sentient being, a thinking animal on this beautiful planet. And that in itself has been an enormous privilege and adventure. So that's our episode of On Books. If you like On Books, please subscribe on iTunes. It's on with a space books. Tell a friend or two or share it on Facebook. That would really help support the show. We'll have notes at the website on-books.com with some links and some extra goodies about this episode as well as other episodes on all the other books that we've chatted about so far and more to come. If you'd like the audiobook of this, it's available on Audible, and that's audibletrial.com forward slash on books with no space, O N B O O K S, uh, where you'll get the first book for free. My name is Chris Castiglione. Episode editor is Gabrielle Urbina. This music you're listening to right now is Bird Star, and the music up front is a Knife Joanna Newsome remix by Taylor Bentz. Thanks for listening.